Hey everybody, welcome back to another exciting episode of the Stash Report from the Stash Project. Today is August 10th, 2020, and we have a whole pile of stuff to get through. A whole slew of kit announcements from overseas, uh, as well as some news here domestically, and kit releases. So buckle on in and get yourself a beverage. I'm not going to be here forever, but it's going to be a little bit longer than the 10, 20, 10, 13 minute videos we've been getting in the last couple weeks. So, on the new kit announcements from Japan, we have the November announcements from Aoshima, and they are a number, of course, of just generalized reissues. And then they have sort of the uh, new stuff for the month of November. All of it is reissues as well. Uh, some of it's a little old, some of it is a little changed. I want to be behind Aoshima. I really like them as a brand for the first half of this decade and or last decade, I should say, the end of the, the end of the aughts. But it is just falling on hard times <laughs> for the last couple of years. Hobby Cat is being relentlessly annoying. So if you hear meowing, just try to ignore it the best as I am. Uh, so reissues of the 74 Honda Life Step Wagon. That is one 20th scale kit reissue of the 91 Mitsubishi. Delica Star Wagon, reissue of the 96 Mitsubishi Delica Space Gear, so both of the delicious Space Wagon and Space Gear minivans coming back out. Reissue of the 1979 Suzuki ST30 Carry in its panel van configuration. Uh, reissue of the 1998 uh, Toyota Mark II Tour 5 BN Sports uh, JZX100. Reissue of the 2002 Nissan R34 GTR in its Sea West tuner version. Reissue of the 1996 Toyota Soar in its Vertex tuner version, and a reissue of the 2015 Lamborghini Aventador Super Veloz in the uh, <clears throat> new supercar line. So the stuff that is uh, nominally different for the month of November, you get a reissue of the 1999 Nissan Elgrind. Now, the Nissan Elgrind has not been out in about 18 years or so, so this is one of those long-go, far-away uh, kit uh, releases. Is available in the Highway Star and the, I can't think what the heck it is, like Knight Rider, I think is what the term is. It was actual legitimate trim levels from Nissan. Uh, the Knight Rider is a little bit more of a VIP van. The Highway Star is more of a top trim touring van uh, in the sense of like touring the country, not like touring cars. Um, to the Highway Star is probably the closest thing to a factory stock Elgrin you're going to get. Uh, in this generation of Elgrin, and they are including all of the body pieces, which is a couple of grills and things like that, to do either an early 90s uh, Elgrin or a late 90s Elgrin. So really technically this gets a four-in-one when it comes down to it. Obviously it would be one body and, and one build-out choice, one unit. You know, you have to pick something to build uh, the way they do their kits, but it does offer you a lot of options. And in the past, those would have been four different model kits. Uh, also reissuing the 1994 Toyota Estima in its uh, Lucida and its uh, Emina uh, versions. Now this again uh, is another four-in-one kit because you'll be able to do either a very early 90s version of the Lucida and Emina or a mid mid to late 90s version of the Emina and Lucida. Now if you're going, what the heck does all of that mean? The Emina and Lucida were... Toyota Estima vans, that's the, the van we got here is in the United States as a Previa, except because Japan is completely and totally out of their minds with the taxes on their vehicles, they made these two versions of the Previa Estima that were narrower and shorter wheelbase than the actual Estima van was, and that magically puts them in a different tax rate. People complain about registering their cars in the United States. I can't even fathom <laughs> the amount of like loops that or hoops you have to jump through just to figure out how exactly you register a vehicle in Japan at this point. Um, but again, those those kits have not been available in over twenty years, none of them. And again, those would have been four different kits in the past. There's two versions of them and stuff like that. But the the base Lucida and Enema or Emina, it's not Enema, it's Emina. The Emina are coming back out for the first time in forever so again if you're interested in in oddball uh japanese vans uh, november gonna be your month also coming back out the subaru sandbar in its 1990 uh, version in the high roof and this is an old motorized version usually you see it packed in like a raft and all this off-road gear this time it's uh japan post so they're creating some new decals for this and you're also going to get a resin 
Japan Post mailbox. A little round thing looks like a looks like a narrower, taller version of like a city trash can. Um, because why not, right? I mean, this tooling is is thirty years old, so why not figure out some other thing to do with it? So throw a resin uh, mailbox into it. Okay, sure, why not? Uh, reissue of the 82 Nissan Skyline R30 Super Silhouette, what they're calling the uh, Ultimate Upgrade Series. Now, they're doing this the month before with that Group 5, nine hours of, or well, technically it was more than nine hours back in the day, but the uh, Kalami uh, Touring Car. This has got the same sort of principle put into it because it is the same chassis underneath both. It's just a slightly different body. And it's a whole bunch of PE upgrades to basically rebuild the chassis out of PE. I'm very interested to see how they plan to get away with that. Because you start building things out of PE, usually you need to solder that together to keep it from falling apart again. Because you can glue it, but it's, you know, the first time you jostle it too hard, the whole thing comes apart like a house of cards. So... Uh, you know, it's an interesting take on the idea of these kits. One of the weak points of the Group 5 Super Silhouette kits are the chassis, because they're old motorized toy universal fit chassis. They're not even really from this kit. They're just something that they put the the uh, kits into. And, the, like, the race car interior for the Super Silhouette's a separate tub with separate side pieces, so that was tooled up afterwards. And the body uh, is goes back to its sort of toy origins, but it's not bad in the sense of, you know, what it is. So it'll be nice to see what those two kits end up actually being when it's all said and done with. And then last thing from November is a reissue of the 1992 Range Rover Custom Off-Road. Now you may recall it's been, you know, 25, 27 years or whatever it was since the last time that the Range Rover had seen the light of day and it was reissued last fall. There was another version of it called the Off-Road Custom version. Oh, imagine that. And that kit has uh, like a big brush guard, roof rack, bigger tires, different wheels, all, you know, all the off-roady parts uh, that you saw of Aoshima and to a certain extent Tommy, because Tommy did that with like the sport option version of the Montero and the Land Cruiser, uh, where they sort of built these sort of off-roady versions of it. So if you had been holding on to one of those off-road custom versions, or whether they're called it the Off-Road RV series, I believe is what that was originally termed back in the early 90s, you know, hoping that would go up in value because the original Range Rover kits are now only worth thirty dollars. Yeah, well, sorry, that's only worth thirty dollars too now, except so, except to people who insist on getting you know, original box art, I guess. So that takes us to Hasegawa for October of twenty twenty. So we got their kit announcements here, uh, four kits that are just straight reissues, and then there's some changes, reissues, kind of things. No, nothing new this month per se, but on the reissue thing, you get a reissue of the one twentieth scale F one. Yeah, one twentieth scale F one. Which you didn't even know Hasegawa did one twentieth scale F one. Of the nineteen seventy eight Lotus seventy nine uh, German Grand Prix winner. Now there's a little back history behind this kit. Uh, Hasegawa decided they wanted to expand out into one twentieth scale F one. And they decided to do this kit, and then Tommy decided to do this kit, and Hasegawa allegedly, as the rumors go, couldn't sell this kit because, of course, everybody went out and just bought the Tommy one. Um, and it's sort of just been a thing that was out there, but you really didn't know too much about because it was the third 120 scale F1 kit that that Hasegawa had done at that point. But there's only so much room in the, in the 120 scale F1 market, right? You do have two companies making basically the same kits at the same time. It'd be different if, if, if you know, the Hasegawa kit was new, which it was, of course, in the when they made it. And the to, Tommy kit was from the 70s, but it was not. It was two modern day kits competing against each other. And, you know, most people are going to, when it all shakes out, are going to buy the Tommy kit just for, you know, the reasons that you would buy a Tommy kit to begin with. You know, it's going to go together and it's going to look like what it's supposed to when it's done. Uh, from all of everything I've ever heard about this, this was actually, nominally speaking, the better, more detailed version of that car, but didn't sell. And that was the that was sort of like the death knell of, of, of Hasegawa's entry into this market. It was like, nope, we're losing money. Forget it. We're done. And so it's interesting to see that come back out. Uh, a lot of... from. Talking to friends in Japan, I don't think anybody really ever expected to see this kit get reissued for whatever reason. I mean, you pay for the tooling. I might as well run it once in a while, right? Um, and and it's not like Tommy reissues their their race cars ever. But uh, yeah, eh, so interesting to see that come back around. And then also reissued the of the '77 Monte Carlo winning Lancia Stratus HF, uh, reissue of the Lamborghini Jota SVR, and reissue of the Mazda Cosmo Sport. This time with uh, no figures, no monsters, no girls. 
And then on the uh, sort of modified reissue side of the, of the slate here, get a uh, reissue of the Toyota Celica four-wheel drive rally car, and this time the Griffon Privateer sponsored, or not sponsored, that's not sponsored, but Griffon Privateer run uh, car that finished eighth in the 1994 San Remo rally. There's also a team uh, decal in there, but that car didn't finish the rally. Uh, then you get a reissue of the Subaru Legacy, uh, sedan rally car this for the 1993 rack royal auto club rally and those will give you the seventh and tenth place finishing cars i want to say that this car needs different wheels because i'm pretty sure that this livery was just done by ray j um less than three months ago less than six months ago probably three months ago and when they released it, they had to release a resin set of wheels with it because while it has a set of wheels that look very much like the wheels that come with the Legacies, the 93 wheels had a different number of spokes. Now, whether or not that bothers you building a shelf model or not is sort of, you know, neither here nor there. But no going into that that you may have to source some extra wheels if you want to be accurate with it. Uh, reissue of the Nissan Bluebird 1600 Triple S. Uh, this kit is something they did a street version of, and they did a rally version of, as I nod to my appropriate boxes. Uh, this is going to have a resin chin spoiler added to it, so we're back to that thing where we're making another version of a kit by adding chin spoiler to it. And also, I believe for the first time, because as I look at the kits, I don't think they've had Wantanabis in them before, or a set of, or it might be mini light, uh, rally wheels. But there is definitely a set of wheels in the box, uh, well, not box, but just sort of the presentation of this, because it's just a silhouette silhouette of the 1600 with this chin spoiler attached to it. Uh, but it does have, like, Wantanabe looking or mini light looking wheels, and that would not be something that came in either of those kits ever. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, different wheel choice, at, at least. And then you get a reissue of the uh, Toyota 2000 GT in its racing version, which is pretty much the street version with a piece of tubing they give you. They have to bend into a roll cage. And that'll be for the 1967-24 Hours of Fuji. Uh, and that'll represent the winning and second place finishing cars. Um, they entered the 2000 GT in a number of races in, the, in like 67-68. And it was uh, usually the winning car, <laughs> too. Uh, they, that was a very reliable uh, endurance vehicle for especially being sort of a hand-built sports car then you're going to get a reissue of the subaru 360 in its racing version this will be for the 1963 japanese auto Feder japanese automobile federation grand prix it is the first japanese grand prix that was ever run and remember back in the day before it became an f1 race it was a touring car race this is the first sort of organized major touring car event in japan's history back in 63 uh, the Subaru 360s ran a class called C1, a small displacement uh, engine class, obviously. Uh, decals included will give you the ability to build the third, third place, fifth place, and sixth place finisher. Also, it's going to come with some uh, resin parts, which were, are in the racing 360 kits anyway. It has a different uh, engine cover and a few other parts that are not in the uh, streetcar kit, so they do those with resin because it's probably just easier than tooling up a new piece back in the day when they decided to make a race car out of it um it also says it's got the limited edition version will have some additional uh metal pieces included so i'm not sure that means pe or or what but i guess we'll find out when that comes around and last but not least we're gonna throw this one up on the screen because it's noteworthy uh to us japanese race car fans it's a reissue of the toyota corolla ea 101 11 this is going to run the trust uh Motors, well, it was not Trust Motors, but the Trust Racing uh, livery. And what is interesting about this is they are releasing two new sets of wheels. This car obviously runs two different sets of wheels, much like uh, most Japanese front wheel drive race cars in the 90s did, where you have a lightweight wheel on the front where the drive, or a uh, heavy duty wheel on the front where the drive wheels are, and then you have a light uh, duty wheel on the back. It's, it's obviously a front wheel drive car. They're tooling up the wheels for this car, which, uh, you know, sounds like, oh, my God, what would they do that for? Obviously, they're expanding uh, the, the lineup, and these wheels will further that goal. Uh, I expect that these prob these wheels probably also uh, could find their way onto an AE92 Corolla Levin race car when they get around to that. Um, and this will allow them, again, to expand this 101 into other race teams more than likely. Um, showing again, they continue this commitment towards the 90s race cars because for them, 
uh, this these wheel sets probably are going to run them, you know, probably around, uh, oh, I'd say, $25,000, $30,000 to tool up because you'll get them in little chunks of two. You know, they do those little sprues that have two wheels attached to them. But there'll be numerous, you know, re replications of that on the tooling. It won't just be, like, one set of wheels every time it stamps. It'll be, like, four sets of wheels or eight sets of wheels or 16 sets of wheels every time it stamps. So when you take into the effective cost of tooling, every cavitation in a tool or every every half of a piece is a cost. So, yeah, you know, if, if you put eight of each on each, that would be, like, 16 grand for, you know, the tool. A little bit more because wheels are a little bit different, uh, you know, animal to get around with fine detail, especially on those multi-spoke ones that were in the back there. But, again, a minor amount of, of money put into it. Now, they already put money into these probably four or five years ago when they started doing this because they retooled all the suspension components uh, and the way they interlace so that you would get the cars to sit properly because prior to that they were just street cars with roll cages and decals on them and they had an obnoxiously ridiculous ride height. But... Uh, so very interesting to see them do that, um, and not and they seem to be taking their criticism to heart of the idea that they are, you know, releasing these race cars with different liveries, but not doing anything to fix the wheel problems that they have. And in a lot of cases, the wheel problems are existential crises because replacements do not exist anywhere, resin or otherwise. So it's very nice to see them, you know, take this. It could have very easily reissued the the car with a new set of decals would have cost them a couple of grand to print the decals out and you know shazam new kit and just put a you know, vehicle may not may not uh match box art and like they do with their kits so very nice to see them do that and that car did finish second in the next to last race of the 1993 season so it is a podium finishing car as well so that take care of our announcements of, from over the seas uh here in the united states we've got one kit announcement from south venus jr they announced this over the weekend they are going to be doing this uh reissue of their 78 oldsmobile 442 kit with the kale yarborough jr johnson first national travelers check livery i almost bought one of these kits and uh this set of liver this livery uh just because, again, I love the concept of this livery because nobody under like younger than me knows what the hell a traveler's check is. <laughs> so it's just fun. <laughs> as I, I've told the story before, as, as a kid going on vacation, had to go to AAA and get your American Express traveler's checks. You know, and these days, kids be like, oh, you, you, you had to go someplace and give them money to give you paper to pay for things? Yes, because credit cards didn't exist back then. Uh, or at least not very readily with very high limits and to a lot of people so there is that <clears throat> talk real quick here about uh the, what's going over at atlantis pardon me while i drink so i'm not coughing all through this video atlantis middle of july announced that they were buying a whole bunch of tooling and the crowd went wild uh, as people speculated what all this could possibly be. Oh my god, it could just be anything. It could be the, the Hope Diamond and all of the all the train wreck Aurora tooling that was scrapped, but people still seem to say, oh, it could all be all the Johan tooling that doesn't exist anymore. Oh, oh, oh. And then we got the announcement that they, in fact, bought a bunch of scratch and dent ridiculousness from round two. And not like, oh, good round two stuff. I mean... I know there's a community out there that argue there's no good round two stuff, but now they they basically this is a whole bunch of old legacy tooling from Lindbergh. It is things that have not seen the light of day probably since before I was born. It is that old. Um, it is stuff that Lindbergh has not run for the most part. Um, they have run pieces and parts of it over the course of time, but not a lot of it. It is a lot of, of, um, you know, I should have had this up so I could read, read it. I have a picture of the other thing I want to talk about, but this one I don't. But it's like ships and boats and planes and sci-fi and, oh, just a whole bunch of just, like I said, just wild odds and ends. Uh, if you've ever looked at stuff that Atlantis sells... They have all of this terribly old stuff, <laughs> and a lot of it is really wildly scaled. And, um, you know, <laughs> it's it's one of those things, like, how badly do you really want a 1 113th scale airplane, or a 1 49th scale tank? Because, I mean, it's close to 148th scale, right? But it's not quite really <laughs> the right scale. So, they announced that they bought... Uh, 
molds were originally created by Pyro, Superior, Lindbergh, Adams, Educational Products, and Varney. They represent aircraft, ships, sci-fi, wildlife, antique guns, figures, and science subjects. And so the crowd went very mild after that point because everybody thought that somehow they had found this vault of, you know, just awesomeness. It turned out, no, it was everything that Lindbergh had just collected over the course of all of the years that Lindbergh seemed to be a vacuum cleaner for bad model companies when they went out of business and uh, carried around all that legacy tooling. Uh, there's been no announcement as to what the sale price for that was. I would personally speculate, now this is only me personally speculating, I have no outside knowledge of this, that they probably uh, paid about what it was cost round two to store it. Because round two had no use for any of this stuff. They didn't really want it. It's stuff they got when they bought what they wanted, which was all of the, basically the 125th scale car stuff and some of the, uh, you know, they've, they've done uh, a bunch of the Lindbergh ships. They've done a bunch of the Lindbergh uh, little uh, dioramas with the skeletons they've, they've uh, reissued. But they don't want all that old pyro and Palmer and all that stuff. Nobody wants that. They, they couldn't, they, my ollies still to this day will throw that stuff out whenever they get models in because they still can't move that stuff that they bought off Lindbergh when the warehouse burnt down back in 2010. So, uh, yeah, I don't think that round two is very interested in that stuff. And some of that stuff, again, has not seen the light of day since it was done back in the 60s. So everybody was like, oh, well, well, per. so anyway, at the end of this month, a couple of days ago, they made this announcement and I'll put this on, as I put this on the screen, if you want to read it word for word, pause it, because I'm not going to go through it like that. But this is an announcement they made at the end of the month saying that they have now gotten a multi-year licensing agreement with General Motors to allow them to reissue vehicles in 132nd, 124th, 125th, and 116th scale. That includes snap tight cars, funny cars, muscle cars, classic American cars, and trucks from Chevrolet, Buick, Colesville, Cadillac, and Pontiac. Uh, more announcements third quarter, so that's by the end of next month. I am uh, very intrigued as to what this could possibly end up being because we know that a lot of the uh, General Motors stuff doesn't belong to Atlantis because, remember, Atlantis only bought the U.S.-based tooling uh, that, has, that, that Ravel has not used in probably 20, 25 years, and Blitz saw no reason to keep, and they sold it to Atlantis. Now, remember, Atlantis then turned around and sold all the NASCAR tooling to Savino's JR, which is how we keep getting all these 1980s NASCAR kits reissued. Um, so what they own from very, very old Ravel monogram legacy tooling will be very interesting to see at this point. Uh, obviously, a lot of the Older 50s, 60s tooling would be 132nd scale. That that flyer made mention of them retooling tires and clear pieces. Some of those old Revel uh, kits from the 50s don't have any clear pieces to begin with, and more than likely would have plastic tires. So I can see them tooling, you know, rubber vinyl tires to go into that because a lot of people are going to get plastic tires and go, "What the fuck am I supposed to do with this?" and lose their minds. Uh, you know, as I sit around, I look around like my collection because my collection sort of spans the very end of the time period where kits were sent to China or not sent to China. We know it wouldn't be any of the G-body stuff because the Monte Carlo and the Grand National were just reissued by Ravel this year. So we know that those aren't in there. I would assume that none of the Corvettes are in there uh, as far as that. Although you may be talking about, with very interesting areas, you may be talking about some of the old annual uh, stuff, like some of the 80s Firebird, 80s Fiero, uh, like, the, remember the Motor Trend series of cars that was done that had the Cougar, the Thunderbird, and the Grand Prix in them? I don't believe any of those kits have been out. Now, they've reissued the 86 T-Bird, which is a 124 scale monogram kit, in that basic builder series, which may mean that tool belongs to Ravel because it's in, you know, China. But I don't believe that any of those, because each of those cars had a three-year run, uh, and they are Motor Trend Car of the Year stuff, like the McLaren uh, powered Grand Prix from like 92 or 93, whichever one it is, because there's like a 90, 91, 92, or 91, 92, 93. And there's a T-Bird that went with that, and there's a Cougar that went with that, and I don't think any of those kits have been reissued in the, in the time frame since the tooling's been moved over into China. We haven't seen like any of the, I'm not sure we've seen any of the SN uh, Mustangs come back out since the tooling was moved to China. 
but they give that's a Ford, so that doesn't really matter. <laughs> Speculation into the wrong thing there. I'm trying to think of what else. You know, the Vets from the 80s, the, the Firebirds, the Camaros, the Fiero, those kind of things. Those might be things that would be out and about, and those would be mostly 124 scale kits. And then you have, like I said, the 125. You have possibly some hot rod, hot rod magazine kits. Although a lot of those hot rod magazine kits were pretty lousy to begin with, and I don't think anybody really wants to see them come back. But it'll be very interesting to see what this will give a, a lot of uh, daylight as they reissue those kits as to what they really actually picked up when they made that purchase uh, two and a half years ago. So uh, very interesting. Uh, if finally Atlantis will possibly release model kits that we'll discuss on this channel, because <laughs> we don't have any use for one 152nd scale helicopters around these parts. So that'll take us to kit releases. There's one domestic kit release this week, and it is this. It is the uh, Rainier Racing 81 Monte Carlo Bobby Allison Hardy's car. Speaking of old monogram tools, remember this is the monogram Monte Carlo with the newly tooled flat nose Monte Carlo uh, piece from Savino's put into it. So that is back out there for vintage NASCAR fans. Uh, that is, like I said, the only domestic kit release. So we go over overseas here, over overseas, redundantly redundant department. So we have some Hasegawa kits and some Aoshima kits this week. Pretty much that's going to be uh, it for that. I'm trying to make sure there's no food, nothing Fujimi or, or anything snuck in here. But no, nope, we're, we're clean. Uh, so Hasegawa kits got three. They're all reissues. Uh, two of them are straight reissues, one slightly modified. Straight reissue of this, the Lamborghini Muria. P400 Super Veloce, the 71 uh, historic kit series that has no no PE, no resin girls. And then you have a reissue of this, the Nissan Sunny uh, GB122 1989 long body deluxe late version because I see a shadow box, I'm filling it with text. Uh, this would basically be the last gen of the Sunnies they built. And then a slightly modified reissue would be this, the BMW 2000 TII with chin spoiler. So yes, everything below the bumper you see on this box art is a resin piece uh, to create a new chin spoiler that's not really specific to any sort of um, maker model. Um, it gives you some schnitzer stripes going around the car. Those are new decals for this kit. But other than that, the actual contents are just... Uh, a whole bunch of parts thrown in here. Um, I don't, I'm not sure that it's really specific to any specific car. It gives you all the parts for like early mirrors and late mirrors, a couple sets of wheels and things like that. So that's out there for the folks who are interested. And then Aoshima, uh, it's like race cars or tuner cars, which which is your preference this month. So on the tuner car side of things, you have this. It's the uh, Toyota JZX100 uh, Toyota Chaser. Uh, the TRD uh, version. So this has a different set of wheels, different set of ground effects than the normal Tour uh, Tour Tour, the Tour Five Chaser sure, Chaser Two Tour Five. Huh. Uh, so that's back out there. And then you have the reach of this, which is the R34 GTR, and it's top secret performance engineering service uh, rebox. And then one other kit that we have is this, uh, which is not a race car, technically speaking, although one might argue that. It is, of course, the Volume 1 A86 Truno for Initial D this month. Um, there is a 25th anniversary of Initial D going on. And so this kit is the same Volume 1 kit it's always been. Nothing new about this whatsoever. It's just in a different box art. Uh, with this 25th anniversary thing. This does not include a figure. So much so that the side box art in this says does not include a figure. Now you might wonder why why, why that's an important thing. Because there are going to be two kits this month, including one of the A86 uh, Tofu car here, that is going to have a figure in it. And it's just sort of poor marketing that you have doing two different versions of effectively the same thing at the same time in a way that is such a cluster that you have to remind people that, no, no, this isn't the one with the figure. You think of the other kits. So at any rate, that's back out there. That does come with a full detail engine, but it is the base model Truno without any of the racing accessories in it. And then we go again to actual race cars here. So reissue of this, which is the Toyota, uh, Toyota, the Nissan, I saw Tomica and just immediately said Toyota. And now my Windows viewer has completely locked up on me. You guys won't know because, again, you don't see that part, but <laughs> it's very frustrating. Uh, anyway, it's a it's the Super Silhouette, the Skyline Super Silhouette Tomica car. Now, this is actually the exact same car we just talked about being released at the end of November with all of the new PE parts to rebuild the chassis with. 
So kind of interesting for anybody who doesn't really pay attention to what's going on. If they were interested in a car with a much better undercarriage, allegedly, uh, they would buy this. Oh, look, it's a Hasami Motorsports car. And then realize that they oops, bought the wrong one. <laughs> so anyway, that's back out there. Also back out is reach of this. It is the uh, 1979 24 hours of Daytona Savannah RX-7 kit. Now doing a little bit of more research into these uh, kits as they've been reissued. This kit actually did win the GTU class in 1979, which makes me want to buy this kit because it is a podium uh, you know, winning car. It's just such a bad kit. Um, it's not really an Aoshima tool. It's an old eye make kit. Um, uh, <laughs> they put some new decals into it. They look really nice. They're not, the last couple decal sets for this have been kind of out of register and stuff like that. The decals that I've seen for this are really nice looking. Oh, it's very tempting. I, and I know it's a shelf model and you're never going to see the bottom of it and things like that. But mm, I'm just very, it's very hard to bring myself to purchase that. And then you have this, which is the uh, 1973 Phantom Ken and Mary uh, release. We talked about when we talked about the kits at the beginning of the month. In 1973, racing was effectively canceled in Japan because of the oil crisis. This would have been what would have been raised from Nissan in 1973, but uh, yeah, that didn't happen. So Asuka took it upon themselves to combine uh, some pieces and parts from their tuners and their Liberty Walk kits and give you this sort of inspirational, what could have been uh, type of kit. And then the, uh, I guess it's the last one, right? I'm, I'm sliding through my photo viewer so it doesn't crash again. Yes, last kit for this month is this, a reissue of the uh, 2000 GTR, the old four-door GTR. A lot of people don't forget that the GTR was actually a four-door car when it first started, before it became a two-door. This is for the Japanese Automotive Federation 1970 Japanese Grand Prix. Gorgeous vintage box art. Yeah, this is almost worth buying just for the box art of... Uh, of the race here uh you can build any of the four cars that are shown on the starting grid here the number 58 car the yellow one on the far right is your winning car the 57 hiding just barely on stage left is the second place car a 59 and 56 finish somewhere in the i think it's fourth and fifth or fifth and sixth but anyway you can build both the top, well you can build one obviously with one kit in here but you can build the, a podium car a winning car or some also rands um very, it's a very interesting uh, livery since they're basically all the same in terms of what the car says, just the numbers are different, minor associate sponsorships, and then a big uh, sticker for the driver's name. It was huge, um, I guess probably to make it easier to read as it went by, you know, be cameras and, and tech being what it was in 1970. So that is back out there as well. I did pick up one of those. Um, it is a, a motorized kit. Uh, it's not quite nearly as bad as the RX-7 is, so I, I broke down and bought one of those so I can build the winning car from that because I have started to slowly get this accumulation of other vintage Japanese race cars and I uh, felt that, that went along with the uh, collection fairly well. At least that's what I told myself when I clicked that pre-order button. <laughs> anyway, guys, that wraps up this one. We hope you guys had a great weekend. Uh, it is Mountain Day in Japan. Technically, it's one of the Happy Monday holidays where instead of getting Fridays off, uh, well, the United States does that pretty much the same thing, where Mondays are federal holidays, except for things that float like Christmas. But uh, it's one of the Mon Monday holidays. So today, te technically, is a day off in Japan. Um, I would have suggested if I made this video early enough to post it first thing this morning, you guys should have all called off work and demand a uh, Mountain Day off for yourselves. I'm not responsible for your firing. Technically, it's supposed to be on the 11th, but they moved to the 10th this year because of the Olympics that, of course, didn't happen. So t technically, tomorrow is really Mountain Day, and uh, yeah, call off. It's Mountain Day. Go to the mountains. Leave me alone. <laughs> we'll see you guys on the other side.